Thank you for joining us for The Power of Faith with David Hathaway. It is our hope that you will be inspired and encouraged by this message. We pray God's blessing upon you as you listen today. Don't forget to visit our website, eurovision.org.uk, for more information on David's ministry. In this episode, David continues teaching from the Book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 21 to 31. In this passage, Saul's dramatic conversion is followed by his bold preaching in the synagogues, declaring Jesus as the Son of God. This astonishes those who knew him as a persecutor of Christians. However, Saul's preaching also stirs up opposition from the Jews who seek to kill him. The disciples help Saul escape by lowering him in a basket through an opening in the city wall. With Saul out of immediate danger, the churches experience a time of peace and growth. The believers are encouraged and strengthened by the Holy Spirit. And the church continues to multiply as people are added to their numbers. Now open your Bible and join David for today's word. Verse 21. Everybody that turned him was amazed and they recognized, is not this the one who was uh, destroying, killing, and imprisoning those who called on the name of Jesus in Jerusalem? And didn't he come here to Damascus to do the same, that he might bring all of us believers in bound, bounds and, and chains to the chief priests in Jerusalem? But verse 22, Saul increased the more in strength, spiritually as well as physically, and confounded the Jews that dwelt at Damascus. So his challenge now is not to the new believers, but his challenge is in the synagogues to the Jews. Well, the obvious happens by verse 23. After many days, the Jews decided to kill him. It's quite interesting, isn't it, that it seems that the only way that they can stamp out this new faith, this faith in the name of Jesus, is to kill them, put them in prison or kill them. You know, it's so easy to become a Christian today. It just amazes me that so few come. In fact, I think if it were harder, that more would come. I certainly know this, that when I was working in, with the underground church in the communist countries, they were very strong believers because they had to pay a price to get in. Um, People don't understand what was happening with the underground churches, but I can tell you that hundreds and thousands, literally thousands of Christians under communism were not just put in prison, they were put in labor camps, but they were killed. They died. Many, many thousands. Uh, that's not spoken of, but I knew because I preached there, and I can remember preaching in, I'd gone to preach and to evangelize in one city, and the pastor said to me, he said, I want you to understand, David, why you're here. You're only here because the Christians were here. This is the town where they were put in the labor camp and they died. And the pastor said to me, David, you're only here because those born-again believers didn't die cursing, but died praying that God would send somebody to bring revival and bring the gospel to this very place. You have come in answer to the prayers of those thousands of Christians who died. You know, I was humbled, immensely humbled by what I heard. So, still following from verse 23, that the Jews now are trying, that's the Orthodox Jews, of course. Um, you've got levels of religion amongst the Jews. There were Jews who were religious and Jews, even today, who are not religious. And so, uh, this was known to Saul, and they 
authorities, the Jewish authorities in Damascus, simply put watch on the gates day and night that if he attempted to escape, they would kill him. So verse 25, the disciples took him by the night and let him down by the wall in a basket. You know, one of the exciting things about my overland journey to Jerusalem, the first one in 1961 and the years that followed as I took thousands of people there, was that we visited Damascus on the way up to Jerusalem, and we followed up the very route. Uh, and it was quite amazing with Damascus because we would arrive at virtually the same time on every trip. I, I was very good at keeping to schedules. Believe me, uh, when you got a 10-day journey, you had a schedule and you had to keep to it. And it was such that they all knew, in Damascus, they all knew when my blue and white buses would be coming and <laughs> they were waiting for us. No, not to persecute us, not to kill us, but because they saw us as tourists and they wanted to make money out of us and sell us things. But we always spent time in Damascus and seeing the walls and they do reckon that there is a place where they is a memorial to souls being let down in the basket. So, in verse 26, Saul comes to Jerusalem. Now he's following the route that I took. Uh, he'd come the other way. Now he's on the road I took from Damascus back to Jerusalem. You know, <laughs> those early journeys certainly opened up uh, <laughs> scriptures in a way that most people wouldn't understand. So, when he got to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. <laughs> but these disciples had seen this man standing and ordering the death of Stephen and standing by while Stephen is stunned. And here he is, and he's back in Jerusalem, and they are afraid of him. The disciples, I find this is very interesting. They didn't even believe that he was a disciple. They thought that he'd come back to trick them and trap them so that they could be arrested. And it comes to verse 27 before someone realizes the truth, and it was Barnabas who took him and brought him to the disciples. And then Paul, Saul, as he still was, uh, Saul explained what had happened, how he'd met the Lord, the Lord had spoken to him, and how he had been not afraid to preach boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So on Barnabas's recommendation, they accepted him, and he remained with the disciples, it says, coming in and going out in Jerusalem. But in verse 29, it says, he now spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and was prepared. And this is interesting because you find out that the Lord has said to him in verse 15, said to, um, to him, to Ananias, that Paul, Saul, would be a chosen vessel to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And here it says quite clearly that in verse 29, he was disputing with the Grecians. You see, you have to remember that Jerusalem and Palestine, as we might know it, had been controlled by the Greeks, it was part of the Greek and Grecian Empire. And at the time of Jesus, that the Grecians were being uh, removed by, by the Romans. The Romans had, had taken over from the Greeks, but you still had a very uh, big Greek influence. This is why the New Testament was not written in Hebrew or Aramaic. The New Testament was, the first New Testament was written in Greek because of the Greek influence. 
And so Paul is disputing with the Greeks. And of course, maybe these Greeks were Jewish, but the Greeks, as you know, later when Paul goes to Athens, the Greeks had 99 gods. <laughs> you, we should be dealing with that later when he's in Athens. So he's disputing not only with um, Jewish believers, but also with Greeks. And then in verse 30, when the brethren understood, they brought him to Caesarea. <laughs> Caesarea is so significant. Uh, it is to me because of the big meeting we held there. For the first time in 2,000 years, we were able to get 4,500 unbelieving Jews into the amphitheater to then preach Christ. So here, what happens? Saul is in Caesarea, and they sent him to Tarsus. Now, he was Paul from Tarsus, wasn't he? That was his birthplace, Saul of Tarsus. And so now it's quite interesting that the disciples are sending him back. It's there that he studied under Gamaliel. So, he goes to Tarsus, and in verse 31, this is very significant. <laughs> I find it significant because when Paul's gone to Tarsus, in verse 31, the churches had rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, and they were multiplied. I don't think it's because Paul had left I think it was actually the tremendous impact that Paul had, and it does appear as if the persecution has reduced. In the face of the ongoing crisis in Ukraine, unity and compassion shine brightest. Today, we ask you to stand with us in support of our brothers and sisters. Together, we can make a difference through evangelism and humanitarian aid. Every day, our staff in Kiev confront the horrors of war. But with your help, they provide hope and humanitarian aid to those in need. Vadim, our administrator, also serves as a military chaplain, bringing comfort and relief to those affected by the conflict. Your support also extends to our evangelism in Central Asia, where the gospel is shining a bright light in these unevangelized regions. To make a donation, visit eurovision.org.uk forward slash donation. In David Hathaway's new book, A Firm Foundation, Strength for Now and for Eternity, David will guide you through the Apostle Paul's letters to the Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. David has written this book to strengthen your faith at a time when everything around us is being shaken. Join David as he delves deep into the truths of the Bible. Order David's book, A Firm Foundation, by visiting our website, eurovision.org.uk forward slash shop. Thank you for listening to The Power of Faith broadcast with David Hathaway. We would love to hear from you. Contact us by visiting eurovision.org.uk. Also available online are many free teaching resources to help you on your walk with God. David has written many faith-building books to encourage and inspire. Order these online today. Each month, David ministers online and in person. Our ministry is only possible because of the faithful support of so many people. For details on our evangelism and humanitarian relief work, visit eurovision.org.uk. Thank you again for listening.